Hello everyone, and welcome back to Let's Play Final Fantasy VII. In the last part, we got through the rest of Calm before going on a snake killing spree, and then we went through the Mithril Mine, ending us again in our first optional party member, Yuffie. And now we're in this area. This is Fort Condor, a largely optional area. You can talk to this guy to gain directions to June, and even though it's like the only other place you can go, but I want to come here. Uh, you never need to come here, though, barring a... A story occurrence event about, later on. Yeah, about about halfway through Disc 2, I think. And actu there's actually something very interesting about that story event that involves uh, if you fail. Do you know about that? Yeah. Yes. I think... I, I, I think... No, I don't show that off, but uh, uh, we'll talk about that more later. Uh, the entire thing with Fort Condor, you may have noticed there was a giant bird on top of this place on the world map at the end of the last part. Essentially... That bird is nesting on top of here. However, the top of Fort Condor is also the location of a Mako reactor that Shinra wants to do stuff at. So they're trying to kill the Condor. However, these environmentalists around here don't want that to happen because they're environmentalists. No shit. They want to save However, they don't, the Condor. They don't exactly have the funds for this. Enter us. We're going to be a source of money for these guys from here on, and this is an entirely optional side quest, but you can get some good items out of it. However, it's kind of tedious to do. Uh, notable though, you can't do this, I believe, until you have at least 4,000 gil in your money, because Fort Condor you need to contribute funds to. Mm -hmm. uh, I, every We'll talk more about this in general, but you can allocate funds to them at the dude that allows you to do the main thing you can do here. Uh... And they use Gil off-screen, I think, but you don't need to worry too much about that. More on that later. But we're gonna do stuff here. And notable, uh, there is some date mechanic stuff, which is why I have this exact party. Uh, when you come here, when you talk to the old dude, if you say, I guess so, Barrett, Aerith, Tifa, and Yuffie all gain points. Barrett's plus five, Aerith plus three, Tifa plus three, and uh, Yuffie plus two. Uh, if you say not interested, they all lose almost that exact same amount of points. And when you say, all right, they gain and lose the exact same amount of points as well. So, big boosts to Barrett, Tifa, and Aerith here. Hmm. So, I have a question. If you if you buy things from the people in Fort Condor, does that count towards the funds, or do you have to... I don't think so. Uh, that sounds like something they could do, but I don't know. Also... In that little rest there, I actually went back to the Mithril Mines and grinded everyone up to their first level 2 limit break. So, Cloud has Blade Beam, uh, freaking Barret has his, Mine, so on and so forth. Oh, that was just so I could. I think it's Grenade? Grenade Storm, or whatever rather. it is. <laughs> grenade Throw? Well, whatever it is, it, so it sounds very Barret. <laughs> yeah, I did that mostly for flow reasons, so I won't have to grind a bit more later. Uh, the shops here don't have much of interest right now. Later on, though, the Materia shop here will have something very interesting for us towards the midway point of Disc 2, roughly. But for right now, let's just head upstairs. Because this is where the main portion of this area... Let me, oh, I that's... have a love-hate relationship with this place. Essentially, the main gimmick with Fort Condor's mission is that it's an out-of-nowhere tower defense minigame. You give them money, and you can hire soldiers with the money you give to the place to defend the area. There are, I think, 16 units types you use to defend the place, and we'll go over that because we're going to actually do the first version of the minigame right here, even though we're going to speed portions of it up. It's actually, it actually does amaze me how long some of these take. Yes, you can speed it up to an extent. They have 15,000, and I can... It takes 3,000 per battle. I'm just going to give them a bit of money right now just to make things a bit easier on them. But let's just say enough, and I think that's going to trigger the tutorial battle. All right, let's do this. Ten enemies, many beasts, so we want to employ attackers. But the battlefield for this is set up in two portions, a high portion and a low portion. There's a bit of a line where you notice the hand has an X over it and it doesn't. You cannot place any enemies beneath, or any units below that line. Don't start the game already. These are the units we can place. We have fighters, attackers, defenders, shooters, repairers, workers, stoners, and catapults. <laughs> stoners. Fighters are your general all-arounders. They don't have any weakness, but they don't have any strength. They cost 400 gil to place. 
Attackers cost 420, they're strong against beast type enemies and weak against barbarians. Defenders cost 440, weak against barbarians, uh, strong against barbarians, rather weak against wyverns. Shooters, 520, strong against wyverns, weak against beasts. Repairers are your medics, they can target people and heal them, they don't have any strengths or weaknesses. Workers are, are healers for the stoners and catapults. Uh, the repairers and workers cost 480 and 400 respectively. The stoners cost 480 and you just place them at the front lines to roll rocks at the enemies. Catapults throw rocks at enemies and they cost 480. This just becomes a game of placing and hoping you have enough money left to do stuff. This is the layout I'm going roughly with this first version of the mini game. And in terms of the enemy units, there are four types. Beast, Barbarian, Wyvern, and Commander. Beasts are strong against shooters, but weak against attackers. Barbarians are strong against attackers, but weak against defenders. Wyverns are strong against defenders, but weak against shooters. And then there's the commander that comes out at the end of any given match, which doesn't have any strengths or weaknesses. I wish I had I wish I had much to say here, but I don't like this minigame at all. Yeah, this is tedious. The enemies slowly make their way up the mountain, even at the highest speed. You can increase the speed of the match, as you can see on the bottom right with the L and R button, uh, the L1, R1 buttons. And you just have to click on a character to use any actions with them, be it moving or attacking another character. The rewards from this can be worth it in the long run. However, the issue is... Because uh, more Fort Condor battles are going to open as we progress through the game, and I'll be noting when they happen and what items they have. You need to backtrack all the way to Fort Condor to do them every single time. And while it's not so bad for the next area or two, by the late portion of disc one, it takes forever to get back here. It's just not worth it. I don't wait. I, I wait until disc two to, to do all these missions. Once you take care of the commander, though, you're good. In the case the enemies make it up to the top, though, you're not entirely out of the running, because you run into a, a mini-boss against the commander that is kind of hard to start, but is overall easier than most other boss fights in the game. And if you win oh. that, you win that. Uh, you win the entire thing. But for doing this first one, we get the Magic Comb, which is a pretty decent weapon for Red 13. So that's only if the commander makes it up there? That's if any enemy makes it up there. Ah, uh, you go into that mini-boss. Well then, wouldn't it be faster to just do it that way? Yes. However, you also have... To, uh, I think you might get a lesser reward if that happens. If you get a reward at all. If you fail completely, though, and by that I mean, like, you failed the, even the fight with a commander at the end of any given run, I believe you're locked out of Fort Condor forever. Yep. You are... They take the rope and they're like, screw you. However, there is an odd quirk to it in that if you just never do any of the fights, aside from the one that's required for the storyline, nothing happens. <laughs> it's like even if you lose? Fights. Uh, if you just ignore Fort Condor for the most part, aside from that first fight and the one you have to do for story later on, uh, the nothing happens to the place. It's completely fine. Huh. Either way, this is Lunatic High. I just wanted to show this off. Lunatic High is a good move. Hastes increases Red's defense, as we mentioned last part, and now I have him moved on to level 2, just so we can start working on that. And that over there is Juna, but we got one more encounter before we fight, uh, get over to there. This is the Zemzalit. Ooh, I like this enemy. <laughs> 285 HP, 70 XP, 7 AP, 165 Gil, can drop high potions, and they have one ability of note, but we can't see it for a bit yet, because we need another ability to access it. So for right now, it's just an enemy in my way. That's pretty lame how you can't get it now because it's such a great ability. Yeah, uh, it can fly in the air notably though, and when it's like that, uh, it's not uh, brain, worms, form, please. Uh, it, it, it's not susceptible to earth type damage. It's weak to wind though. We'll be seeing that enemy again later on in the game so I can get what I want to get from it. It also appears later on in Final Fantasy IX, I think, right? Uh, yeah, in one specific area, and it's the only place you can fight it, is right there, so get your licks in while you can. Yeah. And this is Junin, or Lower Junin, more accurately. This is the original town. Junin, essentially, in Lower is this sort of two-story place. The first story 
is this old town, but the second story is at the big town, which is a, essentially a military fortification. And I'm showing you off my material setup for a very good purpose, but we'll talk more about exactly why later. Yeah, I never had much to say about this smaller town here. It's all it's it's the stuff higher up that's a little more important. Apart from I, apart yeah. from I guess one thing that you can get in this town, but I think you get it regardless of what happens, as I recall. I think I know what you're talking about, and yeah, but let's see if we can head on up there. Hello. Okay. Aww. Yeah, we can't we can't head up there, Shinra. Yeah, as it runs a tight, it runs a tight ship around here. Can't get up there, so let's head down here, I guess. Monopoly over the whole place. Hello, random girl. And your random friendly <laughs> dolphin. That's weird. Apparently, real life animals are in Final Fantasy, not just the monsters. Yeah. Cause the uh, there's dolphins in Final Fantasy X too. Yeah. They never quite explain why this girl randomly has a dolphin friend, but I guess we accept it. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, true. It's basically free willy. But random boss uh, fight. Where did that thing even come from? The ocean. But, like, there's an electric current right there. Oh. Ooh, yeah. She she can drown in there, and there's some electrified currents in the okay, water. Okay, oh, so boy. we gotta be quick for this boss fight. Not actually, no. there's not a time limit. That'd be, that would suck if there was. So, this is Bottom's Well. 2500 HP, 100, uh, 550 XP, 52 AP, and 1000 gil. Weak to wind and immune to earth, because it's flying. Uh, and it drops a power wrist, which increases your strength by 10, I believe. Which is very nice. So sounds about right. It's also, uh, I think it takes half damage from gravity. And the notable thing about this fight is that it has... An ability known as, I think it's Bubble or something along those lines, which encases a character in a bubble. It's essentially the same as Reno's Pyramid Attack, only you need to destroy it with Magic-type attacks. And if you get trapped in all bubbles, it's game over, I believe, right? Uh, yeah, because you can't escape. Yeah. Uh, notable, though, summons and ca uh, enemy skills and all uh, uh, magic materia linked to the all materia will work for just taking care of the bubbles. Huh. I didn't know that. The bubbles also have another effect, unlike the pyramids, in that they actively drain the target's HP as long as they're trapped within them. So you need to be pretty proactive about taking care of that. Oh, really? I didn't realize that they actively drained it, because it doesn't look like it does that. It also... Bottomswell also, I think, has three different attack patterns, depending on how erratic its movements are. Also, you need to target the actual bubble, not the character within there. Uh, I think the biggest thing that changes is that it can gain access to its ultimate attack, Big Wave, which is sort of like the thing Apps used back in uh, the Sector 5 section of Midgar, but it doesn't damage it, I think? Uh, nope, yeah, it, it, just damages the it just damages the party. Overall strategy, use Beta, it's your best magic spell at this point. Physical attack with Yuffie, because Yuffie's uh, boomerang-type weapons, which is why I got that one from the formula earlier, are counted as long range and thus can just do damage standardly. Uh, limit breaks when you can't. If you need, to, if someone needs to be taken out of a bubble, do it. And there's the power wrist. I always put that on cloud or red. Yeah, uh, cloud's probably who I put it on the most regularly. Uh, but I've put it on some other characters over the years just to experiment. But uh, Priscilla was in that water for a little bit. <laughs> She... she's gonna be alright, isn't she? Yeah. Well, we have to do CPR to get through this, and... To this day, I can't tell exactly how this little minigame we have to do works. We have to do CPR on her. The way this works is that Cloud's lungs are gonna show up just to the left of him. And there's a bar that's gonna slowly raise up after you press the circle button. To this day, I can't tell if you just need to get the lungs to the peak of their, their air capacity once, uh, in order to get her out of this state, or if you need to do it, uh, just get a certain amount of air into her, period. Uh, notable though, if you 
overfill your lungs, you uh, Cloud exhales all of it at once, and you have to wait through a bit of a lengthier animation to do it again. Again, though, no time limit. I find it weird how there's no time limit, because I, I actually originally thought you could fail this. As far as I'm aware, no, you never can, which is kind of weird. There's a girl drowning right in front of us, but... <laughs> now I think about this is pretty peaceful music for this. Yeah, it's not very atmospheric, but I guess better to not have the player panic. There is also a notable weird little lag with the bar where uh, it can fill even after you've pressed the button because it may have already started the previous animation. Because it doesn't go up uh, in fi uh, infinite amounts. It only goes up in set increments of like... One, three, two, four. three, four, yeah. five. I know I've done this minigame quicker than this and slower than this. I, To this day, I still can't tell exactly how this is supposed to work. I can't really say either, to be honest. But we got her. She's safe. There, I'm sure there's a speedrun tactic to this. Oh, absolutely. There's a speedrun tactic to a lot of things. Hell, there's one very interesting thing that you can do in a couple of cutscenes where you can find a way to control Cloud in the middle of the cutscene and skip dialogue. Oh, I guess I've seen things like that before. There's also another one where, uh, interesting thing, whenever there's a scene that where Cloud is not there, technically speaking, just because of how the game works, they have to have him there in the code. So there's just an invisible cloud model coded in there. And sometimes in uh, one notable cutscene, very early on in disc two, or actually no, about a third of the way through disc two, uh, you can control him and leave a room before a cutscene dialogue starts and just skip the cutscene. That's pretty cool. <clears throat> I've actually never thought about that before. But since we say Persia, this old lady is going to give us some beds to use for the night. I think if you talk to some of the people around here before this that are a bit cold to you, but nothing of real note. I'm not sure why, though. Yeah, it's kind of weird, but let's rest for the night. Or I could accidentally press the wrong option. <laughs> so now I have to exit, re-enter. Gosh dang, Kyle, what the hell? Let's get some rest. There we go. Resting is good for your body. Do it. Yeah. And then this music Oh, starts. I haven't seen this in a while. Eh, it's been a while since we last had one of these little freakouts. Five years ago. Back at Nibbleheim? Why are we bringing that up again? Yeah, Tifa was our guide. Why does this person care about Tifa? Is this Cloud subconscious? I, I still can never figure out what is going on in these cutscenes. It's probably just a dream. It's one of those things... These, Whenever these kind of scenes happen, it's taking me years to figure out exactly what's going on. I think I have a good grasp on it now, but it's just kind of all over the place. Yeah, why don't we try asking Tifa about what happened? She'd know. She'd, she'd know about it as well as us. Barring the whole point where we don't know exactly how we both got out of there, but... <laughs> this song... Oh, yeah, get used to sharing ah! this music for the rest of this part and er a good bit of the early portion of next, people. I love this music. It's so good. I love this song, too, but I hate it at the same time. I wonder why you hate it, because it might be for the same reasons I, at one point, had a love-hate relationship with it. It's just because we hear the song on loop for at least, like, 40 minutes. I mean, at some point, I'll just put my own headphones in and just block out the music that's playing in this game, honestly. If the loop goes on for that long, yeah, I have ways around that. And we're not joking, people. Get used to hearing this song for the next bit. And hey, there's Priscilla again. How you doing? Yeah, it's looking alive. Alive and well, thankfully. Which is a pretty good positive. But yeah, she thought we were Shinra earlier, which is why she wasn't helping us. And admittedly, with Cloud around, I can't entirely blame her because he's still wearing the sh soldier uniform, technically. But she gives us the Shiva materia, which is a sec our second summon materia that does a bunch of ice elemental damage. Does she damage. know what that thing is? Is she like, this is a pretty rock I found or something like that? Or does she know what the materia is? 
I don't think she knows exactly what she is. She probably just thinks this is useless materia, because I, I doubt she's been in many combat situations. <laughs> she's a little girl. She got knocked out flat by that thing. What we're hearing right now is the practice and early beginnings of Rufus's presidential induction ceremony for Shinra. And this song, I think it's just called Rufus's... In, uh, uh, it's, I think it's called Rufus's right? welcoming ceremony, something like that. Yeah, and I, I love the way the song sounds. I love the military feel that it has going on, but my god, it goes on for too long. So many minutes. But now we need to sneak into Junin, and Prasia has a way to do that. However, I should note, if you want to do all the Fort Condor battles, the first one optional one you can do is available now. For winning it, uh, you get a peace ring. Notable, though, you have to go all the way back there on your own. The peace ring, though, prevents, I think, Berserk, Fury, Sadness, and Confusion. Confusion's probably the only one of those that's really worth preventing. Even then, Confusion's not really a big problem in this game. However, I should note, you want to do that right now, because that one's only open for a very short period. Also, I should mention with Fort Condor battles, if you move forward in the story and not fight a certain battle... That battle is technically lost forever, as is their prize. Really? I didn't know that. Also, screw this minigame. I suck at this minigame. I figured out a method for this over the years. What we have to do is have Mr. Dolphin help get us onto those rafters. We need to jump on him and have him jump with us. However, I should note, the moment you get into the water... Another Fort Condor battle opens up, which is why I said you have to do that last one right then. The prize for this next one that opens up right about now is three Ethers, but I think the game lists them as tinctures. Ah, uh, Final Fantasy VI lingo. Alright. Jump down there once, call the dolphin again, and then jump directly up, and you're there. Wait, serious? Don't have to do any extra movement? Seriously? Good lord. Yep. It, if you don't move beyond that, you make it up here, no problem. It took me years to figure that out, and now we're on top of Junin, and whoa, that's cool. Ooh, airship. Ooh, me want. Fun facts, uh, I think it's on the back of the instruction manual for the game. There's an image of Aerith looking at this. And now it's eerily quiet. I don't like this. Just the sound of the wind. And yep. the cloud's all by himself Also... Now. This is mostly just me going on an old superstition. If you had the cu controls customized, switch back to the standard controls for this next portion, because I think the next portion's little mini-games are coded better or just work better in general with the standard controls. Oh. Yeah, these mini-games suck. Sucky, suck, suck. Awful. Yeah. Ugh. But now we need to get dressed because this guy, again, because Cloud's still dressed in the soldier's uniform, thinks we're just a standard Shinra troop. And thus, we are now part of Shin, uh, Rufus's welcoming ceremony. Things back memories, yeah. I guess all soldiers have to wear this at some point or another. <laughs> and walk off screen to load the other model. I couldn't stand wearing this thing anymore. Yeah, there's probably a point when every... Major infantryman probably hates wearing that stuff anymore. And we don't know the greeting ceremony. Oh boy, time for another minor tutorial. Mm. Have you ever gotten this perfect? Because I never have. I think I've done it maybe once on an emulator with extreme safe stating. Trying it legitimately like I do here? No. Gross. I. Uh, I, I honestly think doing this next portion, though, you want to do it just under perfect. Just under perfect. Well, I should know. When we say perfect, do you mean, like, the maximum score possible or getting the best reward? Because I've gotten the best reward. I mean times. best reward. Okay, getting best reward, yeah, I do that all the time. Uh, getting best score possible, I think I've only done once. Uh, yeah, that was all clear. <laughs> uh... I think I've gotten the best item possible, with the exception of um, one specific minigame that I really don't like. And it's the one you're about to do, I think. The, yes, the parade? I hate it! Alright, because we ah. had to give us a little tutorial, 
we are now technically late to the parade. So we're going to have to interject ourselves elsewhere. Also, I like how they made a model of that car just for this car. I, actually, that's I think the car from that cutscene. Uh, yeah, the that's F &B the car back. from the, uh, the cutscene. Holy shit, I've never noticed that. <laughs> well, now we know. Huh. Been playing this game most of my life, and I've never noticed that. Wow, that's a big cannon. Only pointed in one direction, though. Well, I guess it can rotate, but... Not much. We don't even know what that's used for yet. Yeah, they just have a random cannon. I My assumption has always been this was here because of the Wutai War, because Wutai is to the west, so they figure any sea-based things could come from this direction. Mm, maybe. <laughs> well, t take a yeah, shortcut. Yeah, we're going to need to take a shortcut. Oh, this minigame just makes me die inside. <clears throat> this is... iffy. I think this whole sequence of events is actually my least favorite part of disc one. Like, as as much as I, as much yeah. as I love the music here, I, the, the minigames, the music looping, it's just unpleasant. All right. Now, what we have going on here, we have live TV ratings. That's going to influence this minigame. What we have to do is get into placement with the rest of the people and march. However, they recommend you go in from the back. I think it's actually better for you to go in from the front, but I'm going to follow his orders anyway. You want to run, no, walk, run, run, and then mash the circle button as much as possible to try and raise the ratings. You're... Reward here depends on your live TV rating. I just barely got the best reward there, which is 5,000 gil for 50% plus. 40% plus is actually, I think, the best reward overall because it's six others, which I think sell more. I don't know actually how I got that there. That should be 5,000 gil. Wait, it fell 1% last minute. Uh, for 30 plus percent, you get six potions. For anything less than 30, you get a grenade. <laughs> In fact, they actually say, send that guy a bomb, and they send you a bomb. What the heck? That... That cutscene is very finicky, and the reason I switched back to the default controls is because I swear it doesn't work right if you don't have the button B circle for that. Oh, for the TV ratings? Well, I mean, yeah. couldn't you just press the opposite button then if it's not working? Well, it's not so much that, because it, it, it selects whatever you have as the confirm button. And I swear it doesn't work right with the X and square buttons. I I, I swear they didn't program that correctly for custom Ugh. controls. There's a couple of times that happens throughout the game, mostly with minigames like that. However, switching the control scheme for a short time isn't too intrusive to me. No. But yeah, the reason you want to get six ethers over 5,000 gil is that if I recall correctly, because each ether sells for 700, yeah, you will actually get more for <laughs> slightly less. Let's see, 700 times uh, that's six. That's 4,200. Yeah, that's, I'd still say that's more worth it in the long run because the others are more valuable because you can also use them as MP recovery. Ow, stop blaming me. Also, this is a bit of mechanics with uh, Juno. Hmm. I find really interesting. They have these little elevators that they never do anything with aside from that. I scene. always feel like I'm missing something in Junon because I think it's one of the areas in... Final Fantasy, Final Fantasy VII that has, like, limited exploration ability, I would say. If you know what I mean. Yeah, it's also one of the few areas in the game you only come to once. A lot of the other towns in the game you come to maybe once or twice. This is the only one you come to once. And need Ugh. to come to once. You messing with the army? Who cares? But, uh, yeah, who cares? I can just hear my dad shaking my fist at me, because uh, I don't think I've ever mentioned this on the channel. I'm actually a, ch a, a family, a, a child of a military family. Dad was in the Air Force, Mom was in the Navy. Though at the same time, they re they, they both said, yeah, you don't have to go into the military. Don't, you, we don't give a shit if you do. <laughs> Yo, you, I, I'm not a military type. And now we have the tutorial for the next mini game. There's we a... have various... Go ahead. There's a good reward from this one. Alright, essentially, it's... 
I don't want to call it DDR, but it's sort of DDR. Just press the button they tell you to, and you should be good. Uh, notable, though, whenever they say left or right face, you don't uh, rotate whatever should be left or right. You just press the left and right buttons, even if that turns you to, like, the behind you. I think this works well with custom controls, but again, I just recommend keeping your controls on default with, for this next section, just in case. Yeah, I've got it. I won't mess I up. Hate don't worry. This mini game so much. It's one. Oh, I like this one enough. It's the better team, than I mean, the, the TV ratings one. one is undoubtedly the worst, but the whole segment just is. Blech. Yeah, my favorite part about the entirety of the Junin segment is actually getting to explore the upper part of Junin, like we're about to do, because we have a bit of exploration before we go to the next mini game. On my last playthrough of Seven, I actually learned there's some very good items in Junon. Yeah, Junon's actually a very fun area to look around in, just because I love the setup of this place. Also, hi, Rude! Don't be rude to us, Rude. Yeah, let me, let me say we follow this man for a moment after we talk to this dude. Actually, I think that's just an item store over there. Yeah, yeah, let's take a look, why not? How you doing, dude? Yeah, this is the item store. It's basically the exact same place. You got the revive uh, material here, I think, is the first place you can find this, which gives you the life and life two magics once you level up enough. I don't think yeah, it's too necessary, um, honestly. Unless you run into a really bad situation. It's not very necessary in disc one. And you can also level up these spells very, very, very easily yeah. later on in the game. Plus, with uh, Aerith's limit breaks and some other just methods around things like enemy skills, it's just not the most useful. There are some decent uh, weapon upgrades here, but I'm going to get better ones later anyway. Plus, this is the place where you can finally get the hard edge for Cloud uh, that I already got earlier. And here's Rude smoking at a bar. I don't know why, but I just really like that we actually have a couple moments like this where we see the Turks off-duty. <laughs> Oh yeah, for sure. Humanizing I them really a bit. do like these cutscenes, especially the one in, uh, I think it's Wutai. Yeah, when we get there later. In fact, I should mention, I think I mentioned back when we were at the Shinra HQ that I don't find Shinra as a group to be that interesting, even though I find the corporation angle, just big evil corporation interesting. The Turks are the one exception to that. I think the Turks actually have a good bit of character to them. You don't see them. You don't see them very much, but they. I think they do definitely have a lot of character. It's amazing how uh, good the writers at Square are, or at least at. I guess yeah. I guess R. I, I would keep using R. Um, at giving characters with minimal screen time as much characterization as possible. I really like that. Yeah, the Turks are a really good highlight. That also. This is where we have a second tutorial hut like the one back in the Sector 7 slums. In fact, those are the ghosts of the Sector 7 dudes right there. But there's also the second enemy skill materia here. Uh, the thing is with another enemy skill materia, though. Uh, the skills you've mastered on one enemy skill materia do not carry over to another. So I need to get, like, beta for that one again. Uh, Matra magic, all that stuff, so on and so forth. And I'll be doing that off-screen, I think, sometime next part, part after. I won't be showing that on screen. I'll, the most I'll be showing is how to get back to the other That's areas. That's partly one of the reasons why I don't get data until later on, just because I'll have the ability to have three characters learn all the abilities at once. Yeah, uh, that is a very good refinement to do. I do it mostly when I can, just so I can have like two betas at once, in the case I need it. But with that, I'm going to need to end this off here. We're going to be exploring more of June in the last part. Uh, last part, next part, just because I couldn't fit this entire section into one part, even though I originally planned to in my notes. But with that, we're going to need to end this off here. Thank you guys for watching, and in the next part, we'll be doing just that. See you guys See you then. guys then.